Welcome to Lecture 12 of ECE 4305, Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will be looking at the important mathematical tool in order, for, in order to form the orthonormal basis functions that will be used in any vector representation of a signal waveform space, which is called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization procedure. So recall from Lecture 10 that we can create a set of orthonormal uh, waveforms or basis functions, um, phi j of t, and these orthonormal basis functions can form the vector space in which we will have our vector representation of any sort of signal waveform. And remember that uh, when we have an orthonormal set of functions uh, across a time interval 0 to t, what we get is whenever we take the uh, product of these two orthonormal basis functions and multiply them with each other and then integrate uh, from 0 to t, what should happen is that if they're not the same orthonormal basis function, we should get a 0 because they're orthogonal to each other. And on the other hand, if, we, uh, if they are one and the same um, basis function, it should be equal to unity. And that's where we get the orthonormal part as, a, as opposed to just orthogonal where um, in, if it was just orthogonal, it would not necessarily be equal to 1, but some other value. Okay, So that's the first very important property of an orthonormal basis function. The second one is that we can use this set of orthonormal basis functions to represent any sort of signal waveform by the weighted combination of, uh, or weighted summation of these orthonormal basis functions, where those weights actually form the coordinates in the vector space that we will be operating in. Now the big question is, suppose you're given a, a, a set of uh, uh, signal waveforms, Si of t, but not given uh, the, uh, the orthonormal basis functions. It's left to you to derive the, these orthonormal basis functions. Well, um, do not fret because there is a procedure out there that will enable you to create uh, your own orthonormal basis functions. It's called Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. Okay, so Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization um, starts off with the following pr uh, process. So uh, what we want to do is, first of all, we have available all the different types of signal waveforms that we would be using in our transmission. So every unique waveform representation that represents a binary pattern, right? So then let's say we just arbitrarily choose one of the waveforms. So let's start with S1 of t, just, just for, if, just, uh, without any loss in generality. In fact, I could start with any waveform that I want, but for simplicity, let's just do S1 of t. What I would do is I would take S1 of t, I would normalize it. And how do I normalize it? What I would do is I would divide it, that waveform, by the square root of its energy. And that would actually provide the first basis function, phi 1 of t. That will be our anchor for all the other orthonormal basis functions that will be created um, through this process. And I must emphasize, depending on which signal waveform you start with, with this process, this will totally change your basis function. So, um, so uh, if I chose S2 of t, I would not get the same set of orthonormal basis functions at the end. So be very careful when someone says, hey, uh, create an orthonormal basis functions based on um, this sequence of waveforms, S2, S3, S1, S4, uh, follow it because otherwise if you choose any other pattern, you're going to get a very different set of orthonormal basis functions. All right. So. Um, why do we do this? Why do we um, take S1 of t, normalize it by um, it, the square root of its ener symbol energy, and then uh, get the basis function? Well, what happens is look at what, um, how we represent N1 of t. N1 of t, S, S1 of t, sorry, um, is going to be equal to the square root of its energy multiplied by um, phi 1 of t. And so that square root of, um, uh, of the uh, symbol energy for S1 of t, uh, of, uh, S1 of t uh, that actually is going to be equal to S11. That's our uh, vector element, uh, the first vector element for S1 of t, its vector representation. So, um, another way of calling it is a coefficient. So the coefficient 
S11 is equal to the square root of the symbol energy for S1 of t. All right. Next step, let's bootstrap this process. So picking up from the phi1 of t and all these waveforms, let's create phi2 of t. So suppose we choose S2 of t as the next waveform to construct our orthonormal basis functions. So the first thing we do is we see how much of S2 of t is contained in the phi1 of t basis function. So what we do is we take the dot product of S2 of t against phi1 of t, and that's accomplished by taking the integral from 0 to t of S2 of t multiplied by phi1 of t, dt. So that's going to give us S2, 1. So S2, 1 is the coefficient of the S2 vector uh, the amount of S2 that is uh, pr projected in the phi1 of t basis function direction. Now, um, what we want to do is we want to uh, isolate the part of S2 of t that is not contained in the phi1 of t direction. So what we do is we define this uh, intermediate function, g2 of t. And what g2 of t does is we take s2 of t and we subtract off the part of s2 of t that's contained in the phi 1 of t direction. So, so what is left over is going to form a new basis function. So g2 of t is s2 of t sans s2 of uh, s2 1 times phi 1 of t. So this should be orthogonal to phi 1 of t. Now we take g, g 2 of t, find its energy, which is equal to zero, uh, integrating from 0 to t, g 2 of t squared, dt, and take the square root. And that should give us a normalized g 2 of t, which is equal to phi 2 of t. And we can then expand g2 of t in terms of um, s2 and s1 and phi1 and, and, and all the like. And that gives us equation 3, folks. This is great, because now we have phi1 and we have phi2 specified. So, if you want to generalize this, what essentially um, the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization procedure is, is uh, whenever you want to create yet another orthonormal basis function from a new waveform, okay, so the next waveform, so let's say we have S3 of t, what we would have to do is subtract all contributions from the other basis functions from that waveform, so the residual uh, waveform, which would be gi of t, or in this case g3 of t, would be everything else other than contained in the previous basis functions that have been derived, and then we would normalize it by the square root of the energy of that residual, and that will give us yet another new basis function. That's what's described here. So gi of t is equal to si of t, the waveform, the next waveform that we're trying to use in order to create the next orthonormal basis function, and then subtract off all other contributions to si of t, leaving only the residual, and then from that, what we do is we normalize that residual, and that will give us a new basis function. Okay, so this is great. So because now, uh, from this, uh, let's actually perform an operation. Let's do an example of Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So what we want to do, and again, remember, order is important in Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. Uh, suppose we have uh, four signal waveforms. What is the orthonormal uh, basis functions? Uh, phi m of t, okay? Uh, if we try and uh, uh, perform Gram-Schmidt on S3 of t, S1 of t, S4 of t, S2 of t, in that order, okay? And then from that, uh, what is the corresponding vector representation, okay? So, um, so, so, we'll, we'll now, I'll, I'll, uh, so let's first draw how these waveforms look like. So suppose we have the following waveforms that we're going to be using for this example. So I'm going to draw four axes. Okay. And I'm going to mark them off as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And so this is time. And we're going to do the same here. 0, 1, 
two, three, four, and that's time. Zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. And so let's say we have signals S1 of T. S, um, let me think, that would be, no, let's put S2 of T here, S3 of T here, and S4 of T here. So suppose that S1 of t looks like this, with, mag with amplitude 1. Let S2 of t look like this, 1 and minus 1. Suppose S3 of t looks like this. one and minus one. And then last but not least, S4 of t looks like that. So these are the four signal waveforms that each uniquely represent a binary pattern, in this case, two bits each. And we need to come up with an orthonormal basis function, uh, function a, set, a set of orthonormal basis functions from these guys. And we're gonna use Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. So now that we know what the waveforms look like, Let's 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 do this entire Gram Schmidt orthogonalization process from the top. So first for S3, that's going to define our phi 1 of t, and that simply is let's normalize S3 of t by the square root of its energy. And it turns out that that's going to be equal to S3 of t divided by square root of 3. Next, we now take S1 of t, and first of all, what we want to do is subtract off um, any part of S1 that belongs in the phi 1 of t basis. So, so we need to find out uh, what part of um, uh, phi 3 of t is contained within uh, S1 of t and subtract it out. So, so what we do is G2 of t is equal to S1 of t minus the contribution of S1 of t that is contained within phi 1 of t. It turns out it's 2 thirds. Subtract it off and now we get this new uh, waveform representation. Okay. Then we normalize G2 of t by its energy, the square root of its energy, in order to get phi2 of t. For phi4, it turns out there are situations, so don't be fooled, that sometimes um, one of the waveforms might be entirely represented by the preceding orthonormal basis functions, in which case uh, it's totally legit if you have a phi, like you know, a basis function that all is equal to zero because it isn't. There is no unique contribution in that waveform, and that's the case we have in uh, S4. And then finally, for S2 of t, so there's a small typo. S S2 of t, we subtract off all um, all the pre preceding orthonormal basis function contributions from S2 of t, we, we which gives us G4 of t. We normalize it by the square root of its energy, and we get S2 of t over square root of 2. So that yields our final um, uh, basis function. So we have three basis functions that are non-zero and one that is zero. So in the end, phi 1, phi 2, and phi 4, because phi 3 is equal to zero, we can represent now our signal waveforms in terms of a three-dimensional space defined by these orthonormal basis functions that form the x, y, and z axes. So that means that S1, S2, S3, S4 can be represented by these vector representations which are nothing more than the weighted combinations of phi1, phi2, and phi4.